I request the uh, uh, moderator for the next session. We have uh, two Dr. Anas uh, who are going to be, uh, uh, no? You're not talking, okay. Uh, but we have two Dr. Anand for the uh, next uh, panel, but let me invite uh, Professor uh, Anand, uh, who is Associate Professor of Finance, uh, SPJ Institute of Management to the ISP. Thank you. Uh, straight away ask uh, Dr. Anand Tangeshwar to complete this presentation. Again, somebody who doesn't require too much of introduction, I'll make it really short and sweet. Uh, I've known him for many, many years, one of the most erudite guys on markets. Uh, and on to every single word he says, he's got a lot of depth uh, and information and research which goes behind whatever he says. Uh, he's also, of course, a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Committee. Uh, so everything that he says uh, and gets listened to at the highest levels of the government. So you know what the government is listening to. Uh, Dr. Anand, all yours. gentlemen and a sincere thanks to the CFA Society for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Just to make it very clear, I am speaking here with my personal capacity, not as a dean of the Aikaman Gandhi School of Business, not as a member of the Economic Advisory Council of the Prime Minister. So uh, obviously the economy and its current state of health is occupying our mind space and let me share some of my thoughts with you and then hopefully in my conversation with Anand uh, we can talk about the implications for financial markets or interest rates etc. So one of the first things we should remember there is a lot of hyperventilation about the economy some of it is justified some of it is not because this is the first economic slowdown in India after the advent of social media. So therefore we do expect to find answers or recovery to commence as soon as we finish writing a tweet or as soon as we finish forwarding a WhatsApp message. But unfortunately, economies don't work to that rhythm. They have lags which are indeterminate. So sometimes we should remember that we are not giving enough time for the natural curative properties of the economy to play themselves out because this is an era of impatience and instant gratification. So that actually uh, makes it that much more difficult for policy makers to act with objectivity with a long term view in mind because we are looking for very, very quick fixes. That's one thing to keep in mind. And secondly, but having said all of that, there is clearly evidence of slowdown. I, I don't need to tell you. Uh, you see it uh, in your own activity, of course, unless you are in the aviation sector, in which case you think there is no slowdown because uh, passenger traffic is growing uh, very, very well, etc. But many other sectors, you do see the slowdown. You can see it here uh, in this, whether it is in the uh, consumer sector or for that matter, uh, sales or even consumer staples are slowed down. So there is a consumption slowdown. And then on top of that, the reason why consumption slowdown is happening is partly because if you look at the, uh, uh, the worker population, <coughs> which is the working population divided by total population, you can see it coming down in rural India, in urban India as well. And then you combine the two from 42% in 93-94, it is down to 34.7. So clearly, the uh, the proportion of the population that is engaged in meaningful employment, which naturally leads to income generation and consumption uh, uh, happening, uh, is not firing on all cylinders, to put it very, very mildly. And then, uh, the most proximate reason. See, sometimes we talk about many things that are hobbling the economy. In a large country like ours, and I think some French uh, cultural uh, uh, performer once said, for every statement you make about India, the opposite is equally true. And uh, therefore, in a large country, trying to become a middle income or a higher income nation within a democratic framework, there will always be permanent issues to tackle. 
But when we are trying to decipher the causes of approximate economic slowdown, the long-term causes are not the only or not the most important explanations. Because in spite of them, our average growth rate had tended to increase from three and a half to five, five and a half to six and a half, and so on and so forth. So what we need to focus on if you want to fix the immediate problem is to identify the most proximate cause, and that happens to be the uh, collapse of the non-banking financial cooperation sector, precipitated by the collapse of Iron and FS, Devon uh, Housing, etc., etc., Finance, etc. So that is one of the main reasons why we have the slowdown, uh, why we have the slowdown in uh, uh, credit growth, which is naturally hampering capital formation. Of course, it has come on top of the banking sector's NPA problems and the corporate sector itself trying to deleverage and get its balance sheet in shape as it did between 98 and 2002. Some of us forget very easily that the 2003 to 2008 boom was largely because the Indian corporate sector had worked its way to a very lean and mean balance sheet which could be re-leveraged uh, from 2003 onwards. Probably we are going through one such phase. This could be a bit longer because the extent of leveraging that happened has been far bigger than before. Therefore, the adjustment also is taking its time. So this is the most important proximate cause of the slowdown. And then, obviously, and part of the reason also is that if you look at the uh, uh, gap between the lending rate and the repo rate, this is as high as it was during paper tantrum in 2013 and also in 2016. So clearly, uh, the transmission isn't happening in spite of the cuts in uh, 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 repo rate by the RBI and the actual lending rate faced by borrowers isn't going down as meaningfully as we would like, although things have become slightly better in the third quarter with the RBI mentioning that nearly 50 basis points of reduction in interest rates have happened. And there are a host of reasons for it. Hopefully, I will get a chance to mention them either in my remarks or the conversation with Anand. Uh, there, there is a risk conversion on the part of lenders as well as on the part of borrowers. And there is a reason why transmission isn't happening because small savings interest rates are way too high. So banks have to pay a higher cost to attract deposits, which in turn make their lending charges much higher than they should be, etc. So these things need to be addressed as well. And then, Therefore, it is very clear that because of the higher lending rates, interest as a percentage of the BSC 100 earning before interest and taxes is clearly running at a very, very high level. And you can see that this right hand scale, which is gone all the way from 15% now to 25%, and interest expense itself in general is growing at the rate of somewhere between 10 and 20%. So clearly, uh, as a percentage of EBIT, there is uh, uh, a clear uh, burden on the balance sheet of the Indian corporate sector. So there is still room for rates to come down from their point of view. Uh, that is why I think in some, to some extent, uh, I would consider the uh, RBI's uh, decision to pause the interest rate cycle, cutting cycle in December, uh, to put it very mildly, as an interesting decision. Uh, uh, so whether or not, in fact, like some of you might have read uh, a well uh, erudite and a good commentator in financial markets, Andy Mukherjee, writing that the time may have come for India to have its own quantitative easing program, which I think is a fairly important uh, uh, argument and proposal to consider very seriously, because even if transmission doesn't happen to lending rates to the corporate sector, there is much to be gained by, uh, by bringing down the government's borrowing cost, because bulk of its fiscal deficit is contributed to by the interest uh, cost that the government bears, leaving far little than what the India needs for development expenditure. So even from that point of view, a fairly bolder, unconventional program with limited duration could be uh, part of the policy toolkit that the RBI may have to consider to bring down government's borrowing costs and open up the fiscal space for uh, a short-term development-related stimulus rather than uh, uh, non-discretionary binding costs such as interest payments. And then, so having said all of this, that this is a slowdown in an era of uh, hyperventilation, instant gratification, which plays its own part in amplifying the sense of distress. And there are genuine slowdown in multiple areas and some of the factors we went through. I also want to give you a sense of perspective, although there is a talk in recent newspaper articles or, or uh, articles in uh, Reuters and Bloomberg, etc., that Brazil and China might have turned their corner in terms of uh, economic recovery. The truth is, India is not alone in facing the kind of economic slowdown among the emerging market states. 
And part of the reason is that China itself has been a rather net contribute, not a net drag on global demand, global supply, rather than being a net contributor to global demand. China doesn't import as much as it should be doing if it wants to play the role of the source of demand. It is actually a drag on global demand because it exports still more than what it imports, especially from ASEAN and Asian countries. Whereas the United States, no matter how critical we are about some of its policies, still remains a source of global demand. And that is one of the reasons why I think the uh, growth rates in all emerging economies have struggled to maintain their post-crisis bounds of 2009 to 13. Since 2014, there has been a struggle to maintain the growth rates that we all got used to pre-08 and uh, between 2009 and 2012. So this is uh, uh, an emerging market related slowdown. That fact also must be kept in mind as we sort of uh, wonder whether India is unique in going through the kind of slowdown that it is going through. Uh, there, there is also, a, I did mention in the very beginning, we must separate the long run factors and the short run proximate causes. We went through the proximate causes, but having said that, for example, if you catch a flu virus, this, the, the, the mildness or the harshness of the infection that you experience also depends on your long run immunity and your health that you have maintained. So, it is a bit of half splitting to some extent to talk about whether it is cyclical or structural. Structural factors do compound the cyclical uh, slowdown concerns and that is also there and more importantly, this debate about cyclical versus structural also make us forget that cyclical slowdowns can be an opportunity to address long-run structural deficiencies. That's a very good excuse. And uh, one of the things we always say is, let's fix the roof when the sun is shining. The truth is nobody does that. Individuals don't do, institutions don't do, governments will not do. And it is not a problem of governments only in developing economies, it is a problem of governments all over the world. Nobody fixes the roof when the sun is shining. Everybody fixes the roof after it rains and at least the first leak happens. And that is true of our own behavior. Look at how much we are willing to change our lifestyle because we know what we are doing is unhealthy. You do that because you know what the right thing to do is? No. You do that only when you are read the right act by the doctor. And that too, you find it difficult to sustain. So let's not expect more from our garments, which are also comprising of individuals like we are, that we don't do ourselves. Because ultimately, the garments make up uh, who we are as well. But there are structural issues, which in fact, have indeed uh, placed a cap on India's potential growth rate in my view. And this slowdown has only kind of amplified the impact of these structural issues. I'll just go through some of them. I mean, look at this slide. You may think that India is nowhere here in this chart, but if you can focus very closely in some of your Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh, it is in terms of learning levels, no different even among the best students from private and public schools. And you look at the women's share of employment, globally it's about 37%, whereas India has been only about 17%, and maybe even has come down even further. So, these are all one of the causes. The longer issue is about the quality of our uh, education of the students and uh, the social and other economic, including physical security facts that come in the way of increasing women's share of employment uh, in the economy. Those two are structural issues uh, to keep in mind. And if you look at the uh, human resource, percentage of GDP spent on healthcare, health expenditure, government share, uh, and then health expenditure as a share of overall government expenditure, and out of pocket, if you look at the out of pocket share of health expenditure, India is one of the highest at 60%, only matched by Nigeria here. Everybody else, even some of the developing countries like China and Brazil, are much lower. Naturally, when you have such a high proportion of private expenditure as a percentage of overall health care, that can tip somebody who has just come out of poverty line into below poverty line if you have one major health shock in the family and if it is compounded by more than one person that it becomes much more difficult to sort of recline above the poverty line and that is still a big issue and then you look at the uh, 
uh, performance across countries on things like diarrhea, etc., and many other health parameters, India in general performs somewhat worse. So health, education, women's participation in labor force are some of the structural issues. And then we move on to more uh, familiar terrain like the economic factors. You look at the uh, vacant housing as a percentage of the total dwellings. OECD came up with the economic survey just a couple of weeks ago and they point out that India has a fairly high vacancy rate compared to other some developing and mostly developed countries. Although there are other countries which are worse than India, India is towards the uh, upper end of this uh, diagram other than the lower end. Naturally, uh, Economics 101 will tell you that the best answer to uh, reducing excess supply is to bring down the prices. Uh, right? So, in, in, in some sense, if, uh, if uh, developers are not able to sell, they need to lower the price. Or for the government to be able to lower the cost of the uh, apartments and their dwellings, which is to increase the floor space index, which, uh, which is very low in many states. Unfortunately, it is a state level subject. And if you look at the floor space index of uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, etc., we are way too below. And uh, Tamil Nadu increased it somewhat modestly, and that is uh, touted as a very big uh, jump in the floor space index, but we have a long, long way to go. That can bring down the per unit cost because the amount of uh, money you pay for the land can be apportioned among a larger number of units and, uh, and establishments. So that is an important state level reform that needs to happen. And then you look at the affordability, you can see here in the case of India, uh, the real GDP per capita growth in the last six years is trailing the growth in real home price indices due to the artificial uh, sense of the dem excess demand that we have uh, in, in our country, which is partly due to these uh, uh, self-imposed constraints in terms of increasing uh, supply and lowering prices. Whereas in many other countries, you can see here, growth in real GDP per capita has outpaced the growth in real home prices, if you look at China, Turkey, Mexico, even Indonesia, etc. We, this is clearly uh, uh, a longer issue that calls out for some more reforms in terms of lowering the prices, which is what brought up, brought up the telecom revolution, which is what increased many other things. Ultimately, uh, the best economic stimulus is lower prices. As simple as that. You don't need a very complex uh, PhD degree to get that logic. Uh, and then let's move on to the uh, farm sector. And my apologies for a slightly smaller farm size, but you can look at the underlying source because it is a publicly available source, Agricultural Statistics at a Glance 2018, released in January 2019. I just want to highlight one single fact here, which is that uh, marginal land holdings, less than one hectare, constitutes nearly two-thirds of the overall land holdings. <laughs> and if you look at the average land holdings, uh, in general, it is about 1.23 hectare in 2005-06, it has come down to 1.08 as of 2015-16. So when, uh, when my co-author, Gulzar Nagarjan, who promised to be here, but of course he's unable to make it, when he and I wrote, uh, Can India Grow in 2016 November, by the way, uh, it is uh, a free download publication. You don't need to pay for it. Uh, it's on the Carnegie India website. One thing we found well before the current slowdown happened, based on our research, the talk of 8% or above growth rates in India were difficult to sustain because we have never achieved even half a decade of continuous growth of above 8% without creating overheating, without creating inflation problems, without creating a high current account deficit, and without causing the rupee to become overvalued. And the, and the bulk of the reason for that is as a production system, whether it is in farms or firms or factories, we are much highly fragmented. We are basically, we don't have scale efficiencies. We don't have to create mega enterprises and mega farms. After all, the optimal farm size is barely four hectares to create a good output. You don't need huge farms like in the United States. But we are well below the optimal size in terms of average, and the marginal farms constitute two thirds of all the farms here. So whether it is in farms or factories, we are a highly fragmented production system. And that militates against India being able to achieve sustainable growth rates of about 8% like for a decade or two decades that China has been able to achieve. And you can see that here, even the corporate sector, look at the number of companies with private capital less than 50 lakhs. And you can see here, 
uh, 300 crores and above, we only have 740 companies. If I look at the bulk of the companies with paid up capital of less than 50 lakh, this is from the Ministry of Capital Affairs website. Unfortunately, they haven't updated it in the last five years. This is the latest I could find. And then you look at the corporate tax rates also, less than or equal to zero, almost 300,000 companies don't pay any tax whatsoever. So the bulk of the taxes are paid by less than 500, uh, you know, number of companies, less than about 300 companies pay, uh, have a profit of profit before tax of more than 500 crores, and they bear more than 60% of the overall uh, share of profits before tax. So clearly you can see here, we have a large, large number of small entities. So in order to be able to lift 1.3 billion people sustainably above poverty, you do need to achieve scale efficiency, not to the extent of capital misallocation that China has done, but we have at least a long way to go towards the median before we talk of extreme capital misallocation. And in order to get here, I can see that in terms of the export performance as well, India in textiles has kind of stagnated, but look at the uh, rapid growth that Vietnam has been able to achieve and Bangladesh is able to catch up with us as well. National textile export share as a share of total world, world textile exports, India has come below 4%, whereas uh, Vietnam has gone towards 6 And why we mention textiles? Because it is one of the relatively less sophisticated value added. It's easy to do it with relatively less uh, 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 literacy levels or skill levels, etc. Most countries, when they begin their economic ascent, they start with the textile sector as their first step towards becoming more value added in terms of manufacturing capabilities. And there, I think if you can't crack that, then it's difficult to crack even higher sophisticated value added exports. Um, in order to be able to create this kind of scale, do we have the credit and the savings mechanisms that are required for us to be able to talk of uh, 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 middle income or a higher income status? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Banking sector assets as a percentage of GDP well below even some of the other Southeast Asian or Northeast Asian countries which have uh, done successfully in terms of economic performance compared to us. Or in terms of M2 minus supply as a percentage of GDP, we are, uh, we are the mean of the, the rear end of the graph. So our credit markets are still relatively shallow. The banking system needs to become somewhat bigger in order to be able to cater to our investment and infrastructure needs. And, and if you look at the household savings rate, uh, although this chart ends in 2015, I have given you the update. The gross financial savings of households was 10.9%. Net of uh, liabilities, it's only 6.6%. And uh, if you look at the East Asian experience, uh, it was in the in excess of 20, 25% to be able to sustain growth rates. And obviously, most of us know that savings are largely determined by income growth, which in turn we saw earlier, we had the, uh, excuse me, uh, we had the uh, uh, employment situation, which has really become somewhat problematic in the last few years. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the longer term growth challenges. For the economy to recover sustainably at the 7% growth rate, we need credit growth around 11 to 12%. So you need 15% credit growth to fuel 11 to 12% nominal GDP growth. Given the current financial system, it is somewhat difficult. That is what Credit Suisse says in the latest report. And even if the private banks were to continue growing at 20% per annum, and NDFCs in the bond market resume 15% growth, given that the PSU banks are likely to continue struggling to grow, there could be still a large 20 trillion shortfall in credit availability at the end of the five years. Therefore, uh, and this is, it's also true, as I showed earlier, India's private credit to GDP ratio is among the lowest in the world. So it is very clear that from a long-run perspective and a short-run perspective, bringing the credit mechanism back on track into good health is the utmost priority, both from a short-run and the medium-run uh, performance point of view for the economy. And then, in a sense, the, uh, the banking system woes can also be traced to our uh, uh, public policies with respect to agricultural sector in terms of free power and free water. We give on the one hand to them and we take on the other hand. We impose, we, we give these things for free, and yet we don't enable them to charge the prices that they could charge when there is a scarcity, when there is a higher demand and production supply. Production is lower, we immediately import 
and, and hit their ability to charge remunerative prices. So, the simplest answer to sustainable agricultural growth could be to let them sell whenever, wherever, to whomsoever, at whatever price they can come out. Instead, we, we impose lots of factors on them to some extent making all these subsidies self-defeating or counterproductive. You look at the extent of uh, uh, agricultural sector power consumption, national average is 20.91%, but several states have agricultural sector power consumption well above the national average, Rajasthan 40%, Madhya Pradesh 37%, Telling our uh, 35 sector Tamil Nadu actually one of the lower ones below national average, and so is Bihar. So basically, because power supply to this sector is largely free, it leads to over exploitation of the water table, and the power producing companies therefore unable to get remunerative price for their power because the discounts cannot evaporate, and if they evaporate, they cannot pay. Uh, of course, not uh, last but not the least, uh, some of you might have read uh, Ha Jun Chang's book, The Korean Economist, who wrote. Uh, kicking the ladder, which is a strategy that uh, countries follow after they have reached and climbed to the top, they kick away the ladder so that others cannot climb. So, uh, in a sense, the climate change bogey and the bogey of hydrocarbon fuels, including coal burning, is a nice strategy to keep the divergence between develop and developing countries uh, wide. So, but the fact is, unfortunately, uh, climate, China didn't face the climate change challenge when it was beginning its reforms in 1979. And developed countries could burn as much hydrocarbon as they could when they began to grow. But now we do have this challenge to face and we are seeing it in our own uh, last few years in terms of the uh, distribution of rainfall spatially and in terms of uh, uh, time as well. It's been volatile, irregular, uneven, etc. So, Fixing this actually could be also a contribution to growth, but this is a reality that does subtract from our potential GDP growth, uh, which was not the case for East Asian countries when they were growing in 1960s and 70s, even for China in the 80s and 90s. So we need to recognize that we do have structural headwinds to growth, and therefore talking of 8 or 9% GDP growth uh, without fixing them will lead to short-term economic stimulus, which could prove to be medium-term counterproductive. And fixing them itself could be a major contributor to achieving 8% growth on a sustainable basis. And this is what I mentioned as our problem of fragmentation of the economy. Many of the concessions that are available when you are micro and small are suddenly withdrawn when you become medium-sized and large-sized, nothing is available. So many firms, are unable to make the trade-off between should I stay small, enjoy the concessions, should I grow bigger and boost my business because they have other costs when they become bigger, both uh, 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 official and unofficial costs including bribes, taxes, employee taxes, corporate taxes, many other things that they face. So net result is they realize that the trade-off is not worth it in terms of becoming bigger. And interestingly, I'm told, according to research by uh, Professor Prabhala at Johns Hopkins University and his co-authors, even banks, in order to meet their priority sector lending obligations, tell some of the borrowers to remain below the threshold so that they can meet their lending obligations. So this is sort of a, a vicious circle that keeps firms from growing. The threshold effect has been a very big barrier for India to cross. And some steps have been taken indeed. Uh, we can retain some of the incentives either if the firms grow organically or retain the same incentives and fiscal concessions when they acquire smaller businesses in the same field or related fields. I think RBA has taken some steps in this regard in the last few years. So the threshold problem is being addressed but in a peaceful manner. Um, and of course, we all know about the state capacity constraint. Look at uh, the overall public employment share in India compared to the US. And for example, New York City has 180 food inspectors for 24,000 restaurants, while Hyderabad had four food inspectors for at least thrice that many restaurants. So whether you talk of state capacity to be able to uh, 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 ensure uh, regulation, law and order, etc., clearly the state capacity is also one of the constraints for creating a kind of society that enables economic activity to flourish. 
Having said all of this, by the way, I am not pitching this book for sale because it is a free download, okay? Uh, it's a free download. Uh, most of these issues, we had covered them in this book, Can India Grow? We wanted to keep the title as Can India Grow Faster? Because India does grow. Even at 4.5%, we are still growing. And the point is, uh, the publishers, Carnegie India, said this title is more provocative than Can India Grow Faster? And we basically calculated in 2016 that sustainable growth rate looks more likely in the region of 6, 6.5% rather than 7, 7.5% due to all these ongoing issues which we face. Um, so it is not all doom and gloom, uh, because changes have indeed happened in the last few years as well, whether you talk about the GST. In spite of all the uh, 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 issues that have cropped up in the implementation of the GST, it is also a fact that the GST Council has proven to be responsive in fixing them we must remember that 440 to 480 state taxes have been reduced to about 40. Even though the number of slabs and the rates can still be lowered, etc., it is a huge achievement in a country to bring down 400 plus tax rates to 40 plus tax rates. And then uh, we also talk of the IBC. Even two days ago, the government had tweaked it to make sure that the criminal liability or prosecution faced by the defaulting borrower doesn't devolve on the subsequent acquirer, etc. Surprisingly, sometimes we think our politicians and the government are slow in responding. I would say that the experience of the GST Council and the IBC tweaks show that government in these two areas has been far more responsive than, let's say, for example, uh, uh, with respect to the inflation targeting regime of the RBI. They, they need to be much more open-minded about looking at it afresh, almost five years after its inception. Does it serve India's purpose as it stands? Or does it need to be tweaked? Does it need to be abandoned? Or can it be modified and continued? I think that debate needs to happen as well. So surprisingly, I would say the uh, government has been far more uh, constructive in terms of responding to the emerging challenges with respect to GST and the bankrupt lease laws. Corporate income tax issues have happened. Herrera has happened, etc. And I think uh, the fiscal rules are obviously currently under pause. But clearly, India needs to have, over the 15th Finance Commission report, we need to have a credible medium-term fiscal strategy. If we have to be able to use the short run to be able to spend more, we cannot do that without creating a, a credible medium-term fiscal strategy and fiscal consolidation. These are the key ongoing reforms that are happening. So there are changes happening. But as I said, we are a more impatient lot than economies uh, take to get back to good health. Uh, again, some of the things I mentioned uh, recently, for example, we all know that the consumption of fertilizers is one of the issues with respect to soil health and so on, but most of us probably may not be aware that the mandatory neem coating of the entire urea output has more or less eliminated the scope for diversion for industrial use. This has happened last few years. And also the objective of cutting down urea consumption to tone down the imbalance in the application of the NPK has partly been achieved by reducing the size of the urea bat from 50 kg to 45 kg. I'm going to talk about the UBC, IBC decision to ensure that criminal liability doesn't devolve on the uh, buyers of uh, stressed assets, etc. And then you have the company law committee in September 29, which was created. And it submitted a report in November to decriminalize a number of offenses that were specified in the Companies Act 2013. Hopefully, it will pass through the parliament reasonably quickly. Because one of my main columns, I did say that besides the kind of big ticket reforms that the pink press is very keen to tout, FDI, liberalization, corporate tax cuts, etc., the path to sustainable growth lies in hundreds and thousands of small steps such as these. And that is happening indeed. Uh, and also, uh, while we showed the textile exports, India is plateauing and peaking. Overall, from a long-term perspective, export performance measured as uh, as uh, export performance measured as actual growth in merchandise exports as a percentage of the total exports of that uh, country. So, in some sense, India has been achieving a steady growth. But there has been a period between 2016 and 2017, India's growth rate slipped. But again, it's coming back in terms of export performance, trying to catch up with China. If the index is 
100 in 2003, we are uh, almost doubled it over the last 14, 15 years, talking about 5% uh, growth rate in export performance compared to Indonesia, OECD itself, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, go back to the slide, compared to OECD, Indonesia, and Brazil, etc. So, I think uh, it is very easy to um, be somewhat overtly in, overly influenced by the uh, 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 stories we, we hear about the short-term difficulties, which are a reality. At the same time, I think multiple actions are being taken. In some areas, it has been far more responsive, but economies do react with a lag. And as I said, in 2003, we could enter into a five-year period of good growth due to a combination of lots of factors, of course, which uh, came together to help India grow. But the, one of the most important things was the deleveraging between 98 and 2002. And we might be going through one such phase. If that is the case, that itself, once it is completed, may add about 1-2% to of GDP growth in the years of 2021 onwards. So what are the risk factors for uh, this uh, last half full story which I concluded with? The risk factors would be, I would say, the divergence between the uh, real GDP growth and the stock market performance, not just in India, but also globally. Uh, if you look at the United States, uh, S&P operating earnings diverged from the national income measure of earnings in a very, very big way between 98 and 2000. So when companies become very creative in reporting operating profits, why they report to the tax man the most reliable number of of profits. And what they tell the investors is much higher than what they tell the tax man. Something is wrong and the market is uh, eventually likely to correct. And that gap opened up between 98 and 2000. And that gap has opened up again one more time in a big way. So uh, I think uh, much as we talk about the settlement of the trade dispute, phase one agreement, the election in the UK has yielded a decisive result, etc. Uh, the underlying truth is there is a divergence between fundamentals and stock markets thanks to the central bank behavior in the developed world and that becomes a risk factor. If it brings down Indian stock market valuations next year, that becomes a headwind for economic growth and recovery as well. And you can see here that in the US, the corporate profit before tax as a percentage of GDP peaked about four and a half years ago actually. It's been coming down since then. Uh, uh, that's the reality. So, uh, my, my overall message is that uh, inside the country, uh, inside the policy making circle, there is an awareness of the gravity of the situation India faces. And there is also a recognition that it is an opportunity to fix some long standing issues. Uh, and they are being addressed. Uh, but structural issues such as fragmentation, absence of scale, health and education attainments, etc., do indeed place a ceiling on the sustainable growth rate we can achieve. Uh, so in the short run, I would say more than domestic factors, international factors are a bigger risk going into 2020. So I know I have left you with somewhat of a mixed message. It is human nature to look for black or white answers, but the reality always is more of shades of gray. Thank you very much, and I wish all of you a very happy and healthy 2020. I think it deserves a slightly larger applause there. So, so those of you who are students of CFA or uh, just about uh, young and starting your careers, uh, look at the depth of data which he's actually looked at. Uh, you know, he started off by saying this is a Twitter age. I can tell you he's not on Twitter. Okay, I think the starting point to his success is he's not on Twitter. And he therefore has enough time to get an uh, immense amount of data and therefore get a much bigger and broader perspective in life. And because he's not on Twitter and foods like we are on Twitter, or every time he writes a great article on life mint, I get all the kudos saying, Anand, well done. Uh, if, I may, if I may add to what Anand just now says, not mutual back scratching. Uh, uh, I learn a lot by reading his columns on, you know, sometimes when I am stumped with an answer for a question, I do turn to two people to look for answers on the market perspective. One is Andy Mukherjee of Bloomberg, and second is Anand Narayan's columns in Bloomberg. I agree with you, Anand. <laughs> so great. Uh, uh, thanks, Anand. Thanks for that. And by the way, he's called Anand. Anand is a beautiful name. Lovely name. Okay, uh, fantastic presentation. 
lots of data. Um, in fact, uh, I got a, a sneak preview of the presentation today morning, and I was trying to sit in the corner and go through that data because it's got such immense depth in it. Strongly urge everybody to go through it. Uh, first question, Anand. Um, the first slide that you brought out on uh, employment, the fact that the percentage of people uh, in the employment range has come down, and then subsequently you showed that women at 17% of the workforce. What on earth is happening? This is supposed to be our demographic dividend. We are supposed to be using our young population to, to grow. And this is over decade. It's not like something which has happened uh, if we can blame Modi on. I agree. No, I think uh, it is not, it is not uh, uh, one government specific uh, problem. Uh, I can only guess a couple of factors which have played uh, to create this kind of a declining in working the population and the decline in the uh, women's share of the labor force. I think uh, we do go through the annual report on the state of education by Pratham uh, and we also look at the state of higher education but we don't connect the two with respect to the kind of skill levels that it is leaving our youngsters with uh, making them relatively unemployable, that is one factor. Uh, and second, I would also argue that the in the more approximate cyclical factor, which is that since 2014, with the corporate sector more focused on getting its balance sheet back in shape, I think this this is a case of where the structural means the cyclical, and they both have combined together to create this unfortunate situation where we should be seeing an improvement in this number. We are seeing a four to five percentage point decline in some of these numbers, and you are right. If we probably have another five years to get this uh, act together, otherwise we would miss the demographic dividend entirely. Uh, I think, therefore, education more than I would say um, the credit markets being broken, etc. Probably education is a much more urgent crisis than uh, uh, than, than these issues. Yeah. I think education and the data you showed on healthcare. Yeah, uh, exactly. Clearly, a clearly a big big area. Yeah, these Can are. I the ask you the dirty question: uh, Instead of demographic dividend, are we headed for a demographic disaster? Look, I would say, I would answer this question again somewhat, I would say, unsatisfyingly. I let me concede that, which is that I don't think we are there yet to calling it a demographic disaster. I think we do have, I think, half a decade and with some luck, maybe another decade at most to fix this. But I wouldn't take uh, the chance of uh, up to 2030 to fix it. If we can get some of our higher education freed up, creating more capacity and more meaningful outcomes, education outcomes. Uh, I mean, I've seen that in my last 15 months and uh, as a dean of the business school, the kind of um, uh, non-academic and academic staff that I'm able to attract uh, who can write a uh, meaningful couple of sentences you know, in an email, etc. It's a huge uh, challenge and uh, therefore I think we have, I, I would say this is a war footing thing that we need to do, otherwise it will become a demographic disaster, which with all its social, social political consequences as well. So education and healthcare, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm now going to go into the section of uh, monetary policy, interest rates, credit, etc. Uh, you started off by saying clearly we're not providing enough credit to, to fund growth in this country and investment in this country. Is it a problem of demand or supply? Uh, uh, I think it is a problem of. <laughs> demand and supply. I would say in some cases probably it is more a question of supply, especially to those sectors which can still use credit. And part of the reason for supply of credit not coming through is it's a perfectly rational response from the from the lenders to the situation that they face, not only with respect to their cost of deposits, but also to the uh, other non-quantifiable parameters such as uh, you know uh, regulatory or investigative agencies backlash and multiple uh, regulatory agencies happening there uh, exercising oversight. So I think uh, I would say if I have to choose between the two, I would say it is a more, relatively more of a supply response than a demand response situation. I, I, mean, that's, that's, I mean that's an uninformed view. Fair enough. Um, I was with some bankers yesterday, uh, credit risk officers and fed risk officers of uh, banks, including private sector banks and public sector banks. Uh, so they had an interesting perspective on this. Uh, they said the people who seem to want money, we don't want to let go. The people who we would love to let money who aren't borrowing, because you know capacity utilization has come down to below 70% and therefore who the hell is, want, wants to invest right now. Um, 
And the reason they don't want to lend money, those who want the money, is possibly because they're concerned about what happens after I retire and then people chase me for uh, a, a genuine lending mistake I made. Uh, so I think that is why it is important that the Prime Minister spoke last week about uh, making sure that the bankers are able to lend uh, fearlessly. And we all know, starting from Dr. Oedi Reddy in 2002, and up to the BJ Nayak Committee report in 2014, everybody has spoken about the need to create a level regulatory playing field between the private sector banks and government owned banks. I think the sooner that happens, at least we would have removed potentially one of the most important headwinds to getting credit to flow again. So I'm, I'm hoping that it happens sooner rather than later. You are a fan of the BJ Nayak Committee report. I think I went through it, and for the most part, I think it's very, very sound. Hopefully, you're passing on that message to Delhi. So <laughs> even though you said you're not speaking for Delhi. Um, one of the issues being mentioned about why people don't want to lend, of course, you're right. Uh, bankers are seeing colleagues in jail, fending off, not getting pension, etc., etc., et all that is there. The second part is there's also a trust deficit. Uh, a lot of people don't trust balance sheets that come to them. Uh, the, the, even for NBFCs, the level of NPAs appears to be far, far higher than what is acknowledged so far. Uh, do you see that getting resolved? Oh, uh, no, I think uh, you, are, you are right to touch upon a very important point which doesn't get covered in the discourse because it is very easy for most of us to focus on uh, one single target, which is usually the elected government as a source of uh, answer for economic troubles. But if you want to diagnose who caused all the problems, it is not just the government policies, it is uh, there is a monetary policy, there is a judicial pronouncement, and more importantly, the private sector behavior itself. I mean, we talk about 2008 crisis, the, the US uh, and the developed world credit trading agencies, accounting companies, auditing companies, and corporates, uh, transparency. So all those issues are played out in the Indian context as well. And to, uh, to some extent, who will build that cap? I don't have an answer to that question, but it is an important contributory factor to the malaise that we are facing right now. I'm, I'm going to switch gears into a topic which again caught my ears. You mentioned QE, quantitative easing. Uh, and I, I know people like Neelkan Mishra have also been pushing for this. Uh, it's a very interesting PMEAC right now. You have Sajid on one side saying no, no QE. You have Neelkan saying QE. So you are in favor of QE. I think if you had asked me six months ago, I would have been also more on Sati's uh, side. But as days pass and as we see the situation changing, we also need to change exactly what Keen said and patching and change my mind, what you do, sir. So I think, uh, but having said that, I'm aware of the pitfalls that if it works, people would see that as a panacea for everything and not do the structural things that are required to be done. So that that, that downside I, I completely recognize. That is why the design of it has to be extremely carefully thought through and uh, new revocably shorter time frame has to be imposed and also a very finite quantum has to be uh, mentioned so that it is not seen as an open-ended giveaway from the central bank to, to the government. So, yes, I, I, I see that I have shifted my own position uh, in the last six months, given the way the slowdown has uh, developed and the financial sector still remains in doldrums and the government's borrowing costs and the share of the fiscal deficit going to interest expenses being so high. Uh, so, I would right now count myself on the side of those who argue in favor of uh, QE. Oh, no, just as an aside, I won't worry about changing views at all. Okay. As a former trader, I change views every day. Absolutely. So that's absolutely fine. Absolutely. Six, months, six months is a Long brilliant time. time. Long time. Uh, no, but just staying on this, one of the slides that you showed in favor of QE mm -hmm. was the fact that our fiscal deficit has been coming down and the share of interest expense as a part of so which means the primary deficit yeah. has been coming down as well. Um, do you trust those fiscal deficit numbers? <laughs> It's a very, very difficult question. It's a very, uh, you slip the minefield into the discussion very, very silently. <laughs> no, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very clear that everybody knows that the fiscal deficit for 2020, 2019-20, the government uh, cannot meet the stated target of 3.3%. The question is whether you sort of disclose the true fiscal deficit in one shot, but also communicate in such a manner the market is not shocked by the disclosure and also back it up with a very credible commitment to the medium term. If we do that, then I think it would actually set the stage for a, uh, for a better fiscal path in the years ahead. 
So we do need to uh, basically take into consideration some of the uh, government uh, spec expenditure which has been pushed on to uh, Food Corporation of India, balance sheet, etc. But not everything that has gone into the uh, government-owned entities need to be brought on, on above line. Because if an entity is creating assets and it is borrowing to create those assets, I don't see the reason why it should be brought to the uh, government's fiscal deficit calculation. So to that extent, uh, people talking about numbers upwards of 6 or 7 percent, that's I think extreme, extremely hyperbolic and overdone. We are talking somewhere between you know uh, 3.8 to 4.5, maybe I'm still on the conservative side, but be that as it may, there is a need to sort of uh, take the market into confidence because what is the informal market's estimate and what the government is saying that gap has to be bridged. So uh, I'm going to push this a little bit. Um, last year, FI19, yeah. the revenue shortfall from budget and from revised estimates was 1.66 lakh crores. Yet the government claimed it only had a slippage of 0.1% of GDP. It went from 3.3 to 3.4 because of that farm Kisan uh, Yojana, etc. Uh, the Kisan Yojana, PM Kisan Yojana, etc. And it said that magically revenue expenditures were brought down by 1.7 lakh crores. Now, every Babu I speak to, uh, every IS officer in the finance ministry I speak to says it's impossible to cut revenue expenditures in this country. How did the government manage this magic? So I, I wish I, I was 3D to the inside uh, uh, calculation mechanisms that show that the revenue, the revenue expenditure has been brought down. But I think you are right, Natin Rai has written about it and you have written about it quite extensively. Uh, I think there is a need to sort of uh, make the uh, workings as transparent as we could. Because I think the more we try to maintain uh, a sense of prudence which market doesn't trust, it will only end up being counterproductive. I think that is the sort of the broader answer I can give. And I think I think we would, we would begin to see some uh, impact on that advice sure. filtering through. Sure. Yeah. So let's move on. Um, Let's take the worst case that actually the fiscal deficit is higher, mm -hmm. and that is accounts for the fact that the curve is very, very steep. Yeah. Your overnight right. rates are 5.15%, right. right. your tenure now is the, the new one is at 6.8, the old one is at closer to 7%. So it's a very, very steep curve, steepest right. curve in the world, right? Um, and that's why you're saying do a QE, or we turn to saying let's do a QE and bring down the term the, the term yeah, um, Have we conquered inflation? Can we be sure that we've conquered inflation? No, I mean, I'm sure. Explaining that, yeah. MMT, Modern Monetary Theory, uh, what is your take on that? Okay. So two questions here. So has India conquered inflation? Um, no, we have not. Uh, because of the fragmentation that I talk about and the lack of scale efficiencies, inflation is a problem that does lurk in, 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 in every corner when it comes to India's production efficiency and so on. So I wouldn't say that we have slayed the inflation demon in the Indian context. But that said, even internationally, there is no evidence that high single digit inflation, inflation rates are a huge headwind for economic activity. There is no theoretical evidence at all. And Paul Walker, who passed away last week, has said that 2% number was struck out of thin air. Uh, and, uh, and today, if you read the uh, commentary by Olivia Blanchard and others are talking about why not four, why not six, etc. So I think there is a, there is definitely a room for relaxing the straight jacket that we have, even if we have not conquered the inflation demon completely. Now, talking about MMT, now in the Western world, obviously the context is different. There is a feeling that inflation has been permanently conquered there. And therefore, they feel there is enormous room for engaging in open-ended fiscal spending funded by central bank, somewhat similar to the, not exactly, but somewhat similar to the automatic deficit monetization that we had prior to 1997. So they are going back to that kind of framework. And there, in that context, and although the defeat of Jeremy Corbyn has kind of temporarily reduced the probability of a uh, balance between labor and capital tilting in favor of labor, in the United States too, I don't see the possibility of an Elizabeth Warren or a Bernie Sanders becoming the president, I could be wrong. But to some extent, if that indeed stokes higher demand for wages and labor activism gets a leg up, 
then we would see the return of inflation in the Western world where they think it has been conquered. So there I would play the contrary. Very smart. Um, I'm going to come to another comment you made about the monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And you called last week's monetary policy interesting within quotes. So here's the deal. Um, growth was brought down from uh, for this year, FI20, from 6.1 to 5%. Inflation, yes, for H2, FI20 was taken up sharply. But one year down the road, FI, uh, H1, FI21, we're looking at 3.8%, <coughs> which is at or below the median. What the hell was Alia thinking? I wish I knew. So uh, you do agree there was a room for a rate? I, as I said, I think uh, I would have looked through the uh, the short run uh, temporary spike in inflation that is going to happen because of the food inflation uh, momentum that's picked up in the near term. I would have seen it through because, and, and I mean, whether or not you relate the bond market reaction in the last two, one to two weeks to the RBA decision, the fact remains that after the RBA decision happened, the bond market, uh, the government decent has gone up by 35 to 40 basis points, and clearly, uh, normally, if the bond market sees it as a very strong anti-inflation signaling mechanism, I wouldn't have seen such a big jump in the yield. So it is clearly being seen as somewhat unhelpful to the fiscal parameters of the country. So on balance, the market sees this effect dominating the anti-inflation credibility, even if it is there in the first place. So net net, I think therefore, RBI uh, decision, the market's verdict is very clear. It's not being helpful. Yeah. Um, broader question. Do you believe inflation targeting works in India? Uh, look, I mean, I, this is a question that I have uh, thought about and I don't think it has worked. Although I fully appreciate the rationale as to why it was brought in in 2014 or 2015 rather. We had gone through five years of double-digit inflation prior to that, accumulating to about 65% in terms of CPI index increase. So there was a justification and a need to bring it down to at least a mid single digit numbers. And that was a framework that the West world had apparently shown that it worked. Although my own work shows that it is the single most important factor for inflation being gained in the Western world is labor angst, labor uncertainty, and wage growth having been effectively suppressed by political economy forces. It's not monetary policy, so the bulk of the credit being given to central banks is actually unearned for inflation, anti-inflation success. So given that, at the very least, I would say, as I mentioned in my remarks, the central bank has to show a lot more openness in, in revisiting the intellectual rationale for the inflation targeting regime. If not abandon it, at least tweak it substantially, because in the Western world, inflation targeting was a war against the labor class. And in the Indian context, inflation targeting becomes a war against the farming class. Okay, great. Um, one last question on monetary policy. Uh, one of the data that you showed was that the savings rate, household financial savings rate has come down to 6.7% of GDP, which is far lower than other emerging markets. So here is the challenge, uh, Dr. Anand. At one level, they're saying bring down interest rates so that investments start. And at the other level, the more you do that, the more you are pressurizing your household savings rate. I think the, the truth is, uh, uh, bulk of the, the most important determinant of uh, savings rate is not so much as the interest uh, that they earn on their savings as much as the income growth. So it's a, you know that we, we all know that it's an endogenous thing. And I think employment and income generation and the savings rate went up in 2003 to 2008 at a phase when interest rates were also, interest rates were high. But that said, that period was a period of high income growth. And if you look at the develop, uh, East Asian experience, they have relatively lower interest rates, but yet the savings rate picked up because of the high economic growth and income growth that they achieved. So I would see this, um, uh, um, the two factors, income effect and the price effect. Interest rate being the price effect, income effect always dominates when it comes to savings rate growth. So if we can get back employment and income generation on track, Regardless of the interest rate situation, we will see savings rate go back. So great, great segue to my next question. What do you think the government and the finance minister or the prime minister should do to bring back employment and growth on track? I think uh, at the end of the day, the standard, uh, which is some of the things that they're doing, just to, the first thing to do is to get somehow credit flow back into the economy. And that I see uh, doing what, besides recapitalization or mergers, somehow 
from the supply side, getting the risk conversion on the part of lenders to go away is a very important component of getting credit to flow back again. And uh, while we talk about asset quality review or creating a sort of a bad bank institution for NDFC bad assets, whatever it can take so that there is a level of trust, as you put it, established between the borrowers and the lenders. In the short run, that is the single most uh, important step we can take to get to go back on track. So, would you support, uh, Andy has talked about a top for real estate, and yeah. others will talk about the bad bank. I think, again, the answer is uh, the situation, why IDC is there, etc., and it is being tweaked in response to emerging challenges. I think the situation, again, as in the case of QE, in the last six months, it has moved towards a situation where we need to somehow isolate the bad assets so that the people with good assets can start accessing the capital market. I think the story has become that much, the, the case for it has become that much more compelling. Okay. Last question, and then I'll take on the audience questions. Um, Great set of data on manufacturing, on exports, etc. And, and you mentioned scale is a big problem, the fact that we're not able to reach scale. Uh, what's happened in the past has happened. Going forward, you know, we've had this manufacturing as the panacea for a long, long time, really hasn't worked out. It's been services, it's been everything else except manufacturing. What are the risks of manufacturing and what do you think we can do going forward? No, so two or two or three things come to my mind based on my own work with Pulsa. So one is, of course, everybody knows, we talk about the physical infrastructure constraints. Uh, the second thing is, of course, the hidden cost, because we still, if you calculate the income tax, plus all other charges you pay, it adds up to 45 to 50 percent of uh, income earned. And that is why uh, one of our uh, previous budgets announced in terms of government meeting the EPFO contributions for three years. That needs to be extended. But the more important thing is, I would say, the system has this unintended consequence of making people stay smaller. And to the extent that we tell them becoming large is not going to be a punishment. I think that's important. And the fourth thing is entrepreneurial skill sets development. Yeah, there is a small experiment that is going on in Madurai. Uh, one of my companies, I'm on the board, the, the entrepreneur decided as a part of his PhD thesis to find out how to equip the entrepreneurs with some basic levels of finance, working capital, cost of goods sold, what is margin, and then also some uh, employment, human, uh, employee human resource skills. The impact on the top line and the bottom line is huge. There is a huge multiplier effect waiting to happen if the entrepreneurs in this country are equipped with some very basic skills required to uh, sustain and grow their business. So that is very rarely talked about. Some uh, 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 literature from OECD and other countries mention entrepreneurial skill set as a gap that holds them back from growing. We in this country talk mostly about infrastructure and fiscal incentives. I mean, like we talk about education. Entrepreneurial education tailor-made for them becomes a very important ingredient of being able to scale. I'm going to and cut some questions together mm -hmm. because they have some common themes. So one set of themes I see is about wealth, inner income inequality, uh, both globally and in India. And, and others are relating to stock markets and real estate markets. Um, we have a funny situation where equity markets, at least some parts of equity markets are doing very well, commanding extremely high valuation, uh, even as we struggle with an economy which is uh, performing below potential. Right? Uh, that's a classical recipe for inequality to go up. Now, I don't beat me up all those IFAs out here, uh, and while I'm running away immediately after this, uh, we do have differential taxation for different asset classes. Uh, while everybody cries about LTCG 10%, equity is still the best tax, and in, in terms of post tax returns, it still offers me the best return. Um, debt mutual funds give me the next best, if I work for three years, like uh, some of us was mentioning. Fixed income is, uh, or other fixed deposits is entirely taxed on marginal tax rate. So there are different tax uh, you know, incentives from the government, which effectively has have pushed a lot of us into this mutual fund. Sahi hai, equity sits is a secret of our success. Um, should the government be giving tax incentives, pushing us into one asset class? No, I think personally speaking, I would say no, because... Um, we won't get killed, by the way. So yeah. <laughs> That's I'm also doing immediately. So, <laughs> so uh, no, I personally don't think. If you look at the... The, the biggest proportion of household savings, even in developed countries, most of them is in deposits. 
rather than in uh, riskier instruments as equities or real estate, etc. And clearly, whenever uh, the economic system or the laws and tax policies, advertently or otherwise, encourage asset price led growth rather than income generation, it, the income inequality, wealth and income inequality is an inevitable consequence. So I think that is something that we need to move away from, not just in India, but also in the developed world. Perfect, I agree with you then. Um, a bunch of questions, including from Shiram on NDFCs and uh, regulations, etc. a whole bunch of guys there. Um, when it comes to regulation and surveillance, um, I can't think of any part of the ecosystem which comes out looking good. Whether it is management themselves, the risk chains, boards, uh, accrediting agencies, auditors, regulators, uh, and the beauty is everybody is blaming everybody else. Look at them, look at me, look at me. Uh, does this require a complete overhaul, you think, surveillance and uh, governance mechanisms? Well, I suppose the question answers itself. I think, yes, I mean, it's, a, it's just so fairly straightforward on my part to say the answer is yes, but the question is, which part of the ecosystem gets disturbed first or disrupted so that the rest of the ecosystem changes uh, happen? And I think, unfortunately, unfortunately, most of us react to coercion better rather than uh, individual willpower. So I guess the, the onus has to rest on the government to bring about the legislative or regulatory changes that force the, uh, the rest of the players in the private sector to, to mend their ways. You look at the um, the big four are also the big five in Van Norton, etc. in the UK, the kind of revelations coming out about the audit company's behavior. So clearly the system is broken and whether it is uh, Southern Soxley or the um, um, post-2008 uh, Dodd-Frank, etc. They have, in, in, in reality, they have sort of badly scratched the surface with respect to establishing trust and credibility. And sometimes when the private sector doesn't do it voluntarily, the only way things work is coercion. Okay, so let's narrow this down for that's a good, good answer. RDI and regulators, are they getting a free pass? PMC, Punjab National Bank, uh, then you have this ILFS, a whole bunch of issues. Uh, where is the accountability? I would only take recourse to what Dr. Reddy himself said in, said in 2018, February, in a speech. He said, in fact, at least internally, RBI needs to come out with an internal white paper on where it has gone wrong in the NPA uh, problem, having reached such proportions. And so I think it is true that as much as the focus of the spotlight and the scrutiny is on the government, there needs to be uh, more questions asked. And since you are in Mumbai, you are a better place to ask those questions of RBI. Okay. Um, there is a lot of questions about uh, data and data reliability, etc. Uh, I'm going to try and combine them here. Uh, one is on, uh, of course, I think we'll all agree that the data should be released, whether it's right or wrong whether it's TLFS or consumption survey, etc. I wish they would release it. Uh, but the, there are some obvious uh, numbers which don't make sense. Consumption survey, for instance, the, the purported, we haven't seen the report as yet, but the purported results don't make sense. I mean, it, it, clearly consumption couldn't have gone down yeah. over the years. Yeah. Um, can we rely on the data coming out from India? I don't think we have reached a point where we completely have to jettison any trust and credibility in the data coming out of India or setting down the growth rate of 4%, etc. I think it just seems more fair. And there are lots of anecdotal data that we still get, whether it is the PMIs or some other surveys, that does tell us the, uh, that does tell us the state of the economy. And I think I understand that there is a serious exercise on to sort of uh, take a whole relook at the way the you know NSSO surveys are being created to restore credibility to the overall macroeconomic database. So I don't think we have reached a point like in China where we completely distrust the macro data. But if we don't fix them in time, we might end up getting there. Like the question you asked about demographic dividend and disaster, uh, we are not there yet. But I think uh, the sooner we get this question out of the way, the better it is for us. Also, slightly different twist to that. Yeah. Uh, given that maybe the millennial economy is a different economy, yeah. do we need changes in the way we actually gather data? Oh, that's, uh, I think that's 
we are not there yet in terms of, I think, uh, India. I mean, maybe it is, it is, a, it is much more uh, urgent in the case of the developed economies than it is for us. But that's it. I mean, the fact that we have five years, every five years we have benchmark revisions and the weights and the components being changed in GDP or CPI, etc. That, that is, there are systems already created to take care of those changes. But to the extent that the consumption patterns and habits and preferences changing in the Western world, I think, I think we are still not there yet. Yeah. Okay, thanks, sir. So uh, we've already overshot time yeah. before CFA closes out. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being very patient. Uh, one last question. I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, indulge myself a little bit here. Uh, if you were finance minister, first February budget, three areas that you would be really focusing on at this point in time. Uh, so, as I said, I would be happy to extend the uh, cost of doing business in terms of labor cost brought down for small and medium enterprises, so that we incentivize hiring, but also puts more money in the hands of the enterprises, which in turn gets passed on to the uh, workers. And the second thing I would focus on, even though it is not exactly budget, budget being purely an accounting exercise, but still we know that lots of policy measures get announced as part of the budget exercise. I would definitely, uh, if not before the budget day, the BGN high committee recommendations on getting the uh, regulatory playing field for the banking sector uh, leveled. Uh, and of course, um, the third thing I would focus on is um, the small savings interest rates becoming more responsive to overall interest rate structure in the economy. And since you only asked for three, let me give you a bonus one. Uh, and the fourth one is the statistical uh, systems and the credibility, even though again it's not exactly a budget exercise. So I think I see all these four as sort of going hand together in terms of restoring uh, faith and trust in the credibility of the process, and the numbers, and in getting the economy back on track. A round of applause for Dr. Ramon. Thank you, Dr. Anand, for that uh, engaging session. Uh, let me summarize the uh, morning session. We have a few minutes before we go out to lunch. Um, uh, we, had, uh, we had Dr. Arvind uh, kick off the session with the uh, global perspective on fixed income markets. Um, we had some talk about their experiences in the Indian uh, you know, fixed income market, reminiscing about how it all started and where we are right now. And then uh, uh, Dr. Ananda and uh, Dr. Anand talk about you know, current situations and macroeconomic uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, issues that faces uh, our market. Um, after post-lunch, we have two panels, uh, very eminent panels that will be talking about uh, the Indian bond market in specific and also alternatives to uh, fixed income market. So hopefully uh, you would stay back and enjoy that. Please remind yourself to mark the uh, uh, evaluation sheets that are in your packet. We like to have your feedback and uh, we value your feedback so that it makes these conferences more effective. Um, I've also been told that you're welcome to take selfies and post them either in front of the, uh, you know, uh, the backdrop in the dais or there's a standee out there that you could use. We'd encourage you to uh, publicize and make sure that this event is uh, you know, well known outside this conference room. As I said, within a few weeks we will be posting all the information that you have uh, heard here or you know, seen here for you to access and then share it amongst your, amongst your colleagues. Um, with that, um, lunch is open uh, and we'll be back here at uh, 1.40 for the afternoon session. Thank you.